So today's lecture is on coasts and coastal processes. And we could start off talking about the edges of the continents. The edges of the continents are called the continental margin. It, inclu it includes three major sections, the continental shelf, the continental slope, and the continental rise. So the continental shelf is the shallower area just off of the coast. Then the slope is where it drops steeply down into deeper ocean. And then the continental rise is a little bit more flat again. And that tapers down into the abyssal plain, which is the deep part of the ocean. So this is what it looks like off of the coast of the eastern part of the United States. This is called a passive continental margin, meaning the coast is not near any active plate boundaries. But if we were to go to the west coast of the United States or the west coast of South America, you have subduction occurring. So you have steeper areas right off of the coast. So in this topic, we will focus on the continental shelf and various processes that occur there. So the shoreline is the area on land that extends from where the water recedes to, which is your average low tide, to the most inland area that is affected by storm waves. The shoreline basically is the coast, okay? It's where the land and the sea meet. So that is the coast or the shoreline. Why is it important to understand shoreline processes? The shoreline or the coast is affected by tides, waves, longshore current and beach drift, riptides. There are beaches related to the shoreline, so it's important to understand beach processes. You have shoreline erosion and deposition. You have sea level changes and effects of storms. And much of the Earth's population lives near the shorelines. So what is the time scale of coastal change? The coastal zone is the most varied and rapidly changing environment and land feature on Earth. Changes can occur over large and small time scales. So for example, global sea level changes that occur over thousands of years are gonna be a large time scale, a long time scale. But then a storm is going to be a shorter time scale and then tides also are a short time scale of change. So first we will go through shoreline processes. And we're gonna start with tides. So the water on Earth is affected by the gravitational attraction of the moon and the sun. There is what's called a tidal bulge. That is the water on Earth that bulges outward due to the gravitational pull from the moon. So you have one bulge directly below where the moon is, and then the other bulge is on the opposite side of the Earth. And that's just a balance or equilibrium issue that causes the bulge on the other side as well. So here, the moon would be on this side, and then in this diagram, and you have a bulge of water being pulled towards the moon this is not to scale, okay? This is, this is showing an exaggeration of water being pulled toward the moon. Okay, and then on the opposite side of that bulge is another bulge. 
So then what happens is the earth rotates, but the bulge stays in the same spot under where the moon is. So the earth rotates into the bulge and out of the bulge. And that bulge is actually where high tide is. So the earth rotates into high tide and then it rotates into low tide. And then it rotates into high tide again and then it rotates into low tide again. So each cycle of Earth's rotation, which is 24 hours, brings each location on the Earth's surface into the tidal bulge twice per day. In most parts of the world, there are two high tides per day and two low tides per day. The water level can change from a range of a few centimeters to 15 meters between high and low tides, depending on where you are on the earth. The flood tide is what we call the coastal areas experiencing a rise in water levels leading up to the high tide. When coastal areas experience a drop in water levels, that's called the ebb tide as the high tide leaves the area. The tidal range is the difference in the water level between the low and the high tide. And again, this varies by location and could be a few centimeters up to 15 meters. So the New Brunswick Bay of Fundy, which is in Canada, has the highest tidal range in the world. It is about 15 meters. So here on the left, you have a picture of high tide. And on the right, you have a picture of low tide, where the boat is not even sitting in water anymore. Tidal ranges can actually vary throughout the month as well because of the lunar cycle. So tides become more extreme at some parts of the month and less extreme during other parts of the month. And that all depends on the positions of the sun, the moon, and the earth. So the spring tide is when the moon, the sun, and the earth align in a straight line so here on the left, you have the full moon, the earth, and then the sun would be all the way on the right. So everything's in a straight line. So that gives you the strongest gravitational pull between the moon, the sun, and the earth. So that's going to be your most extreme tides or the greatest tidal range. So that's when you have your highest high tide and your lowest low tide. It also occurs during the new moon because during the new moon, the moon is in between the earth and the sun. So we can go back here. So the new moon and the full moon are the two times of the month that the moon, the earth and the sun are aligned in a straight line. Then we have the first quarter and the third quarter. Those are the times of the month when the Earth, Sun, and the Moon are aligned in 90 degree angles. So that's going to be your neap tide. When you have the 90 degree angles, the pull, the gravitational pull from the Moon is in opposite direction. Right? So this is going like up and down and the sun is pulling side to side. So their, their pulls are like counteracting each other a little bit. So this is when we have the lowest tidal range of the month. So it's your lowest high tide and your highest low tide. So it's referring to the range of the difference between the high tide and the low tide is the smallest. So these are your least extreme tides. It's called the neap tide. And again, the spring tide is the most extreme tides.
tidal range can also be affected by the shape of the coastline. So narrow funnel shaped bays are going to give you the greatest tidal ranges. So that would be the Bay of Fundy in Canada, which I showed you a picture of already. But here is another image of this. The greatest tidal range in the world, again, is the Bay of Fundy in Nova Scotia. So during low tide, you could walk around on this beach. And then during high tide, it's all completely covered with water. It's pretty deep as well. So the range is about 15 meters. And again, it's because it's a narrow bay, it's funnel shaped. So if you look at the diagram on the bottom right corner, whoops, you could see the Bay of Fundy is a funnel shape. It's very narrow. So the water builds up in that funnel shape. And that is what leads to the extreme tidal range. So then I have this little video of the Bay of Fundy. Um, I'm going to pause the recording. So that was just a short video clip that shows you the tidal range changing in the Bay of Fundy. Now, if you are watching this as a recording, then you could just look at the YouTube link. Okay, so then we have waves. Now here's the anatomy of a wave. The crest is the top part of the wave. The trough is the bottom of the wave. Wave length is the distance between one crest to the next crest. And wave height is the amplitude or the distance from the trough to the crest. The wave period is the time it takes for one wave cycle or the passage of two successive crests. And frequency is the number of wave cycles per second. This is just a Bill Nye video. Let's see if it works. This is a wave tank. Scientists use this to measure waves in water. Now, if you look closely, you can see the wave length. It's the distance from the top of one wave to the top of the next wave. Or you can measure from the bottom of one wave to the bottom of the next wave. It's the same distance. And then if you stand in one place and count, you can measure the frequency. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, L. It's about two waves every second. Oh. And then this is the amplitude, the height of the wave. Take a look at these particles here in the middle. So they're moving around in little circles, but they're not moving that way along with the waves. The waves are going right through the water without carrying much water with them. Isn't that cool? Okay, so then we'll move on. Waves form from winds blowing over the water surface. That is related to friction. The height, length, and period of a wave depend on the wind speed, the length of time that the wind has blown over the water, and something called fetch. Fetch is the distance that the wind has traveled across open water. So in other words, the greater the wind speed blowing over longer periods of time over larger areas of water are going to give you larger waves. So 
So then we have wave movement in deep water. Wave of oscillation. The wave of oscillation in the open ocean or deep water has molecules that move in a circular motion. So we have this toy boat here and it, you can see what happens to the boat as a wave is moving across the ocean. The boat is gonna get lifted up and it's gonna move in a circular fashion and the boat ends up in exactly the same spot that it started at. That's what happens to particles in the ocean. Deep ocean though, we're not talking about the coast, we're talking about in deep water. And you'll see what the difference is in a couple of minutes. Okay, so that's the wave of oscillation. There is no net movement forward or very little net movement forward. So the wave energy moves forward, not the water itself. <coughs> Excuse me. So it's like earthquake waves. There's no actual movement forward. It's just the energy of the wave is moving forward through the water. And then there's this little animation here. So again, wind leads to wave formation and wave energy dissipates with depth. So the effects of wind are negligible between a certain depth. Okay, so the, the wind is forming these waves. The orbital motion is happening, but as you go deeper into the water, the effects of the wind becomes less and less and less. And then you hit a point of depth where you don't have any orbital motion any longer. That depth is called wave base. The wave base is approximately half of a wavelength. So you look at the wavelength in the diagram and then it's like half, approximately half of that. Below that, there's no orbital motion. Okay, so that's your wave base. And again, the strongest effects of the wind is going to be at the water surface. So now what happens when a wave reaches more shallow water? So as waves approach shallow water at the coast, if the water is shallower than wave base depth, the wave oscillation will be interrupted by the seafloor. And then the wave will start to slow down. And we get what's called wave shoaling. That's when a wave enters shallow water, the wavelength shortens, wave height increases, and then the wave topples over and breaks. So you can see all the way to the left, the orbital motion is above the way the, where the uh, depth of the water, like the seafloor depth on the left is deeper than the wave base. So the orbital motion is just ending in the middle here. But as the wave energy hits the seafloor, when you're on like the continental shelf and the water gets shallower and shallower, at a certain depth, the orbital motion is going to hit the seafloor and it gets interrupted. And then that wave will slow down at the bottom. So because it slows down at the bottom but keeps moving at the top, that causes the wave to start to break. So you see on the top of the diagram, you get like the white, that's the wave starting to break. And then 
at some point the wave is going to get too steep and it'll topple over and crash and that's when it really breaks. If anyone ever goes to the ocean in the summer or any time of year, you can see at some point off in the distance, you could start to see the waves forming. If anyone's ever gone swimming and you want to look out for the big waves that are forming, you would look to see when the, you start seeing the white marks, the little white, that tells you that a wave is forming. And then I have this animation here. It's not going to work, is it? Um, let me see if I can get this to work. Okay, so in order to watch this, you could just go to the link if you want to watch that again, if you're watching the recording. This is what a breaker looks like. That's when the wave height increases until the wave is too steep and then the crest plunges forward. Now we don't get waves this large on the east coast of the United States. This is more like the west coast of the United States would get waves this large. Then we have wave generated currents, specifically rip current. So water is brought on shore when waves break and then the water is going to pile up and build up on the beach. Then it goes back into the water, the, the, the built up water goes back into the ocean that's called backwash. And it'll find a topographic low area, for example, between sandbars that are under the water. And then the water is going to rush back out to sea in a narrow current near the surface called a rip current. So rip currents are narrow. They're surface currents, meaning they're on the surface of the water. They're not like at the sea floor. They can travel hundreds of meters away from the shore and that could actually carry people out to sea. So even experienced lifeguards have drowned in rip currents. Rip currents can be very dangerous. If you ever get stuck in a rip current, you're supposed to swim parallel to the shoreline to get out. So instead of swimming like if you get stuck in a rip current going out to sea, you're not supposed to try and swim directly back to the shoreline. You're supposed to just swim out of the rip current, like going across the shoreline, out of the rip current, and then you could swim back. Now you could spot rip currents because if you notice how like this part is like this foamy area of water. And then this is kind of a foamy area. You could see the water is going back out to sea in those spots. And then along here where the other areas have white foam, this area looks a little bit more smooth. Right, you see it better all the way out here in the background where you see like smoother water and then you see the white foam going back out to sea. These are different indications that those are the rip current areas. Okay, so here's a rip current, here's a rip current, here's a rip current, and here's a rip current. Now, this is from Google Maps. You can also look on Google, Google Earth, but this is from, Go, from Gilgo Beach, which is just east of Jones Beach. So I looked up beaches, and this was like the best picture that I got. This was actually from August 2015. So it was just a, uh, a day in August, and you could see 
the rip currents really, really easily from the satellite image on Google Earth or the, in Google Maps. Okay, so like you can see these plumes of water going back out to sea. So these are the rip currents. So it's actually really easy to see them. Okay, so let's take a break and come back at two o'clock. So near shore processes are processes that occur in the near shore zone. That is the area from where waves begin to shoal up to the low tide line. And again, shoaling was this. Wave shoaling, when a wave enters shallow water, its wavelength shortens, wave height increases, and then it topples over and breaks. And again, that happens when the water becomes more shallow than the wave base. So near shore zone is the area from where waves begin to shoal up to the low tide line. So that's right about here where waves hit the wave base depth to your low tide line. Then we have something called the surf zone and the swash zone. We'll get to those as well. So I just have a little bit of this movie called Beach, A River of Sand. And I'm going to show it to you. Okay, so if you are watching the recording of this, you can always go ahead and view it on YouTube. Okay, so this just ref reviews why do waves hit the coast at an angle. It's because the waves are generated by, sh by storms that are offshore. And then the waves radiate outward. And then they happen to hit the coast wherever the coastline is. So this part of the wave hits the coast and slows down while the rest of the same wave is able to keep moving. So that causes the waves to sort of straighten out a bit when they hit the coast, but they don't end up becoming completely parallel to the shore. They just straighten out a little bit more than what they were when, as they were approaching the coastline. So after that water hits, the coast at an angle, it builds up within that surf zone area and it creates a long shore current. So instead of the water just hitting the coast and stopping, you have movement of water that starts building up. So in this case, it's moving towards the left of the screen. Right? So it, it hits here and then it kind of water builds up moving that way. So that pink line represent the longshore current direction. So longshore current is a current that travels in the near shore zone or the surf zone and it moves parallel to the coastline. And it forms because waves hit the coast at an angle causing the water to build up and move along the shoreline. And this is just a couple of diagrams showing you the longshore current. Then also we have something called beach drift. So beach drift is the zigzag arrows that are shown here. 
So it occurs as waves come onto the shoreline and then that water that goes back when the wave goes back to sea, it carries the sand, right? So this pushes sand on the coast and then the, the wave goes back out to sea. Pushes sand on the coast, the wave goes back out to sea. So over time, sand will migrate down the shoreline in a zigzag fashion. That's called beach drift. And then longshore current is off the coast a little bit, and that's also gonna move sediment down the coast. So again, beach drift is the movement of sand along the coast. Sediments move along the beach in a zigzag pattern within the swash zone. That's where waves move off and on the shoreline. The term longshore transport is the net movement of sediments moved by beach drift and longshore current combined. Usually the sediment we're talking about is sand. Then we have depositional features related to near shore currents. You have a spit and a bay mouth bar. A spit is a finger-like projection of loose sediment into a body of water such as a bay. A bay mouth bar is a spit that closes the mouth of a bay. So I have this animation. Okay, so for this, you'll just have to look this up online. If you can't find it, then email me and I'll send you, I'll, I'll send you the link. You should be also able to use the link that's on the PowerPoint. Just for some reason, I can't get it to work. Okay, so this is a close up of what a spit looks like. Again, it's just this little bit of sediment that kept moving with longshore current. It kept growing in front of this little bay that's over here. And then here is a spit, a photo of a spit. This is a spit, another spit, and it shows you the longshore current direction. So in this case, in which general direction is sand being moved along the shoreline by the longshore currents? You can determine this because the spit is growing that direction. Great. So you look at like what direction the spit is pointing towards, and that is the direction that the longshore current is moving. Okay, so what, what would the answer to this question be? You could write it in the chat box. Correct. Southeast. Right? The spit is growing in the southeast. Both spits are growing in the southeast direction. Correct. Right. Answer number two. That is correct. So then also barrier islands are related to the near shore process of longshore currents and beach drift. So barrier islands are long, narrow islands parallel to the shore. They are separated from the mainland by a lagoon or a marsh or a bay. And they are found at gently sloping continental shelves and coasts where there is an abundance of sediment, which would be the Atlantic and the Gulf Coasts of the United States, for example. So here are some barrier islands. This is along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts. 
off the coast of North Carolina. So you see here's the Atlantic Ocean. This is the barrier island. And then you have this water called Pamlico Sound. And then behind this water is gonna be the mainland of North Carolina. So then we have more of a local example, the barrier islands of Long Island. Now this word barrier islands up here, I'm not seeing that the Long Island Sound is a barrier island. I'm just kind of labeling that as like the title of this picture. So let me just move that so that no one gets confused. Okay, so the arrow here is pointing from this barrier island. It's enlarged over here. So that's Long Beach, Atlantic Beach, Lido Beach, Point Lookout. And then on the other side, this is Jones Beach. So behind the barrier island is a low energy marsh or bay basically the Great South Bay. Now, Jamaica Bay is another example of one of these bays that are behind a barrier island. Although the Rockaways, this area right here, um, uh, yeah including this area over here. This is actually more of a spit because it's connected to Long Island as opposed to these barrier islands where you need to actually take a bridge to get there. Okay, so some of these are connected to the rest of Long Island and some are actual barrier islands. Okay, so again, you have the high energy side of where it faces the ocean and then behind that you have a low energy marsh or bay. And then you have a bridge, usually you need some sort of bridge to get to the barrier islands. And then the growth of the Rockaway area is towards the southwest. So the longshore transport along the south coast of Long Island is this direction. It's west, but a little bit south. Then we have coastal deposition. What is a beach? A beach is made of unconsolidated sediment and it extends landward from the low tide line to a change in topography. For example, where the dunes begin, like sand dunes, a seawall or a cliff. The beach is the most actively changing part of the coastline. Within the beach, you have a back shore that's the area of the beach that usually remains dry. It would be like over here, that's your back shore. The berm is the part of the back shore that's steeply sloped. It doesn't have to be extremely steep, but it's steeper than the flat area of the back shore. Then you have the beach face, which is below the berm, and that's going to be affected by the waves. And then the foreshore area is exposed at low tide, but underwater at high tide. Quartz is the most common mineral on sandy beaches because it is the most resistant to weathering. And we went over that when we did the sedimentary rocks chapter. Other minerals that are found on sandy beaches include magnetite, zircon, 
garnet, and feldspar. Now the magnetite, you can actually collect a little bit of it on a magnet. If you were to bring a magnet to the beach, you run it across the sand a little bit, you should be able to pick up some of the little tiny black particles that are magnetite uh, minerals. Most sediments on beaches were transported there by streams. So beaches are made up of whatever loose material is available. And we went over that in the river chapter. Also, some beaches are made of broken shells, coral fragments, or volcanic rocks, or gravel. Because again, it depends on whatever loose material is mostly available in that location. So on the left, you have a photo of a beach in Florida. And the beach is mainly made up of shells and shell fragments. That does not look like a beach that you're going to want to walk around barefoot on. Right? And then on the right, you have a beach in Hawaii made of black sand. The black sand weathered off of basaltic lava. The rocks that are there are made of basalt. So the sand is black. The sand in New York on our sandy beaches is more of a tan white color, not white, it's more like a tan, it's mainly quartz. This is a close up photo of some sand that was collected at Orchard Beach in the Bronx. And the whitish light color you see in the background is mostly the quartz. But when you look close up, you see the little tiny black dots, that's magnetite. If you look really, really close, you might see a little tiny bit of like these reddish colored crystals. It's hard to tell with my finger showing through. It's, you know, it's hard to tell which is my finger and which is the garnet. But there's some little tiny red crystals in there that's garnet. And then you have beach sediments, when they're affected by waves, are going to become smooth and rounded. And you can see this pile here of smooth and rounded pebbles. Notice how there's no sharp edges on any of the pebbles. They're all extremely smooth and rounded off. And then you have a shell fragment here that's also rounded. Now beach glass is not a true sediment, but it does end up becoming rounded and smooth, just like the pebbles and the shells. Then we have something called a rack line. Rack lines are linear piles of marine debris that can include natural and man-made debris, shells, seaweed, beach glass, sea foam, sea grass, and trash. They get washed up on the beach from incoming waves and tides. They are oriented parallel to the shoreline. So as you can see in this photo, that rack line in this photo is a lot of seaweed, right? So when you go to the beach and you look down the shoreline, usually you see some sort of rack line. Again, whether it's seaweed or little pieces of seagrass, trash, broken shells, usually you see some sort of line. The line is going to be more distinct after a storm. Also, rack lines will tell you how far inland the waves came during a previous storm. So after, let's say, Hurricane Sandy, 
Joan's speech had a rack line that went all the way up, like underneath the boardwalk. And actually further behind that as well. So rack lines can, will mark how far inland storm waves went. Then I have a, another beach river of sand clip. Let's see if it works. sandcastle below the high tide line know something about the processes that shape beaches. The waves have restored the beach to its original condition. washes up on the beach, sand grains are lifted up by the water. Each wave picks up millions of sand grains and moves them. What effects do these movements have on the beach over long periods of time? Still photographs of this beach have been taken from the same camera position over a period of years. Let's compare some of these photographs. The sand comes and goes according to the season. At the end of a summer, the beach is piled high. At the end of a winter, the sand is gone. The following summer, the sand returns. But why? In summer, the waves that wash up on this beach are small and carry less energy than the winter waves, which are bigger and more powerful. Such seasonal changes in wave size may be the cause of the seasonal changes in the beach. Let's check this idea. This is a model beach in a wave tank. We'll be able to make waves of different kinds in the tank and see what effect they have on the beach. First, we'll make some small waves, the kind that are most common in summer. To speed up the process, we'll use the time-lapse camera and condense two hours into 30 seconds. The small summer waves push the sand toward the shore in the form of migrating sandbars. Eventually, the waves push enough sand onshore to form a steep beach face. Now watch what happens when we make bigger waves, the kind that strike the beach in winter. The bigger winter waves gouge out sand from the steep slope and deposit it as sandbars offshore. The result is a beach face that looks like this. Now watch what happens when we make summer waves again. The sand that was taken away from the slope by the big waves is put back again by the smaller waves. In other words, the sand moves back and forth between the exposed beach face and the underwater part of the beach slope. Okay. And again, um, you could always watch that video again. I do have the link there. 
So sand on a beach is constantly being moved down the beach by waves, beach drift, and longshore current. What happens if that transport of sand down the coast is interrupted? So let's pretend that we have some interruptions. So first they have these things called groins. Groins are constructed at right angles to the beach and they're meant to interrupt the sediment transport so that they could trap the sand and then help widen a beach and make it a bigger beach. So these groins here, right? And then the longshore current is going this direction. So what happens right over here, the longshore current is picking up sand from here and moving it here. So then this part of the beach will end up being wide. And then over here, the same thing happens. You have the longshore current and beach drift pick up sand from this spot and bring it over here. And then it gets trapped on this side. So it kind of maintains a wider beach going out this way, as opposed to a very narrow beach. So that is what happens when you have groins constructed along the shoreline. And you can see that here as well. This is a picture from England. And you have a series of groins sort of close to each other and that allows the beach to have some sand that accumulates and gets trapped. So again, it, it, it makes the beach a little bit bigger. Out like this way. Here's another picture of it. The longshore current is moving this way towards the left. And the sand is going to build up here on this side of the groin and then erosion happens on the other side. As more waves hit right here and then move the sand that way. Then we have jetties. Jetties are built to prevent deposition in channels to keep inlets open. So usually jetties are constructed in pairs. So here we have this jetty and then a jetty next to it. And then the longshore current is this direction. You trap the sand against the jetty here. Instead of the sand going across here and closing off this inlet, That's the whole point, because this sand otherwise would go across the inlet and then you wouldn't be able to go up into that harbor or into that inlet area. So if we look at the bottom picture, this jetty trapping all the sand before the inlet. So now you're able to have, these are all boats in here. So then you're able to still maintain this inlet so that boats can go in and out. If this jetty were not here, if this jetty was not here, this sand would just travel across the inlet and close it off. Then we have something called a breakwater. A breakwater is a barrier built offshore parallel to the coast. And I have another diagram of that earlier on right here. The breakwater was right here. Right. So the purpose of the breakwater is so that boats can dock behind it 
Great, so the boats are gonna dock behind the breakwater and then it prevents the strong ocean waves from hitting those boats. So that's the, point, the whole point of the breakwater. But also the breakwater prevents the waves from hitting the shoreline. So it disrupts the beach drift. So then you end up having a bulge of sand growing behind the breakwater. And every once in a while, they have to dredge that out so that you can still maintain using the breaking the breakwater there so that it remains as deeper water. I'm just going to change this to beach drift right on the bottom. It disrupts the beach drift. It does also disrupt the longshore current, but um, Mainly it's the beach drift. So here's a picture of a breakwater. Again, that's the breakwater and this is the bulge. And again, here it's this disruption of longshore transport. Longshore transport is longshore current and beach drift together. So you have that sandy bulge going out. Okay, so then we have sea level changes. There are two types of sea level change. Eustatic and relative. Eustatic sea level change is when you have changes to global sea level related to the amount of water in the ocean basins or the volume of the water. And that's related to warming of the oceans and a change in the actual amount of water in the oceans from glacial melting and the gro growth of glaciers. Okay, so going back to the warming of the oceans, Related to global climate change, as water gets warmer, it actually expands. So that increases the volume of the water without actually adding any more water. And when glaciers melt, it increases the actual amount of water in the oceans. But when glaciers grow, it decreases the amounts of water in the oceans. Relative sea level change is a local sea level change. That's related to land uplift or land subsidence, which is also called land sinking. So if land gets uplifted, the sea level is going to appear to get lower. If land is sinking, the sea level is going to appear to rise. These changes can be related to plate tectonic activity, glacial isostasy, and sediment compaction. Glacial isostasy is just the land rebounding after glaciers have melted. So this shows you as sea level, the sea level rise is not as bad in areas where the land is rising. But in areas where the land is sinking, global sea level rise is going to be more extreme. So this is actually referring to global sea level rise. Global sea level rise. So sea level rise is going to threaten beaches because sand in many areas is going to require replenishment. Many coastal areas will get flooded as sea level rises further inland. You'll have increased flooding during storms. 
and you get something called saltwater intrusion into the coastal groundwater. This photo shows sea level rise in Miami and it is showing a time of day where the street actually gets flooded by seawater. It's not from a storm. It's not from rain. It's just during different times of day, you have high tide. So in this case, because of sea level rise, when it becomes high tide, the streets get flooded in parts of Miami. So there were projections that parts of Miami are not going to be able to be inhabited in, I think the article I read said like 50 years from now, there are parts of Miami that you're going to, people are just going to have to move because of the sea level rise. Now sea level rise in Venice is also a problem. It's exacerbated by the land in Venice sinking. The reason the land in Venice is sinking is because Venice is made, is um, the buildings and the city is basically on soft sediments. So those sediments get more compacted over time. So the land sinks. So these are just pictures of the water pretty high up in Venice. It doesn't, it's not like this all the time. It, this is like um, the main, there's like the, a main square in Venice. So it's not always going to be like this. It'll be more like during times of high tide, for example. But you can see there are areas where there's sea level rise actually affecting people today. Then we have Norfolk, Virginia. They also have some issues with sea level rise. And that's partly related to the sediment in the area being compacted. So you have areas in Norfolk, Virginia that are flooded regularly because of the high tide. So anytime there's a high tide, you have parts of the air of the city that get flooded that are not supposed, they're not like normally underwater. For example, a road. They didn't build this road so that it gets flooded during high tide. It's just that as sea level rises and as Norfolk, Virginia sinks a little bit because the sediment gets compacted, the roads now get flooded when there's high tide. Then well, there's a couple of videos about the Maldive Islands. You could watch those on your own. It's, you'll probably get a better uh, res resolution of the video if you watch those on your own. Um, okay, then we have sea level rise in New York City. So here is a map that projects sea level rise in the future. So the red areas indicate land expected to be flooded if there was one meter sea level rise. And that's expected by the year 2100. The yellow indicates the land expected to become flooded with six meters of sea level rise. And that's a longer time range that is not defined in this study. It's just in the future, if there were six meters of sea level rise, all the yellow areas would become flooded. 
but with only one meter of sea level rise anticipated by approximately the year 2100, the red areas will be underwater. And I have another video about rising sea levels. This is something you can't, this is not on YouTube, so I'm going to show you. Yeah. Two days of driving rain have killed at least five people and inundated Jakarta, the capital of Indonesia. The rising water has left more than 100,000 people homeless, and there is more rain in the forecast. One official says, quote, the weather is our enemy. A thought that brings us to this week's grim report about global warming and a looming climate catastrophe. Rising temperatures grab most of the headlines, but we didn't hear as much about rising water. And as ABC's Bill Blakemore explains, that may be the scariest part of all. What's in the report is sobering enough. Global warming is unequivocal and irreversible. Man-made greenhouse gases are shooting up, driving the rise in Earth's temperature and sea level and the decline in Earth's snow cover. But there's a massive unknown worrying the scientists. Sea levels could rise in the coming decades faster than anyone thought. The warming has now reached down more than a mile to normally frigid deep ocean currents. Water expands as it heats up, so scientists know that sea level will rise up to about two feet before the end of the century. But there's also a gigantic wild card. The Greenland ice sheet, two miles thick at its center, enough ice to raise the world's oceans 23 feet. It's melting so fast lately, the scientists in Paris couldn't settle on any predictions for it. We don't know what the likelihood is that part of those ice sheets might suddenly destabilize. I would bet that the rate at which Greenland contributes to rising seas is going to increase in the near future. NASA's Walid Abdullahi and other glacier scientists have never seen anything like what's been happening in Greenland. We've seen widespread glacier acceleration in many, many parts of the ice sheet. It doesn't take that much change in sea level to have significant impact in coastal regions. It's not just a future threat. Even without a collapse of Greenland's ice sheet, there is already a humanitarian and ecological catastrophe bearing down on coasts and island nations worldwide. Indonesia's officials say 2,000 of their lush tropical islands could disappear by 2030, just over 20 years from now. Just based on sea level rise, scientists can calculate. Scientists say that even if humanity soon makes drastic cuts in greenhouse emissions, sea level will keep rising for centuries. What humanity may be able to control is how much and how fast. Bill Blakemore, ABC News, New York. Okay. So then how do we protect the coast from storm-related damage? You know, a lot of this is going to be reminding people of Hurricane Sandy, because that was one of our most recent large storms that impacted the local coastline. So in order to protect for storms, we can build seawalls, which are embankments of reinforced concrete or stone, and that just stops the waves from reaching areas behind the wall. We could put something called riprap down, which are basically piles of boulders or piles of concrete that you line up on a beach or a shoreline area, and then that helps absorb wave energy. And also you can maintain sand dunes in an area. The maintenance of sand dunes is mainly by planting grasses because the roots of the grasses help hold the sand grains together. Also, you may see signs that say keep off of the sand dunes. So when you see the signs that say keep off of the sand dunes, part of that is because they're trying to maintain the sand dune. This is a picture of a seawall built in Seabright, New Jersey. And it is 1.5 stories high. A story is 10 feet. So basically that's 15 feet high wall. 
and it prevents storm surges from the Atlantic Ocean, which is to the left of the wall, from washing over houses and stores in Seabright, New Jersey. And this is before and after Hurricane Sandy pictures. Right, so on the left is taken before Hurricane Sandy. On the right is right after Hurricane Sandy. And you can see sand has gone over the seawall. You can see that the, um, this railing here is broken. You can see this building is on its side in the background there. But generally, the houses behind the seawall look pretty much okay. Although I'm not there, I wasn't there. Just going by the pictures, they look like they're still standing. So maybe the seawall did help. It looks like it. This is another picture from Seabright. And Um, after the wall was built, the beach narrowed. And what else? Yeah, so you can see the seawall here. That's the seawall. Now, this is rip wrap and it is protecting the retaining wall behind it. So instead of just having like a, a regular beach coastline, they put all these boulders and that is gonna absorb storm energy from storm waves. So the storm waves are gonna smash into the rocks instead of smashing into buildings and smashing into the sand it lessens the impact of storm waves. Now here are some sand dunes in Smith Point, Long Island. This picture was taken right after a nor'easter. So you can see storm waves had cut into these sand dunes and this part of the grasses are like hanging down because the sand is now missing. But this is normally looks like a regular sand dune where it's like continuous, like a regular, like a hill of sand. But the storm waves went all the way back to the sand dunes and cut into them. Now this, you could see like all the way here in the side, that's where the water normally is. But during the storm, the water went all the way back here. So we have something called beach nourishment programs. And that's when large quantities of sand are added to beaches when after sand has been eroded away during storms. So you go offshore in this little boat here and they dredge the sand from offshore and bring it back to the beach. It's almost like a vacuum cleaner they're going offshore, they're sucking up sand and then putting it back on the beach. Now this is only economically viable as a long-term solution if we limit the nourishment programs to only a few areas. And the way you would pick the areas would be beaches that are good for tourism. Okay, a beach that's like a really big beach that's really popular during the tourist beach season, that's going to be a beach that you're going to invest money into replenishing the sand. So you can see here a dredge offshore, and then you have a pipe that pumps the sand back onto the beach. And then here's another picture. There's actually, this is from a YouTube video that you could actually watch the whole video. So there, you're pumping the sand back onto the beach. This is just the waterline right near the beach. 
and then a bulldozer comes, <coughs> excuse me, or these like caterpillar machine, <coughs> excuse me, and redistributes the sand on the beach. So if we go back here, it says on the bottom, if you visit a beach along the Atlantic coast, it is more and more likely that you will walk into the surf zone atop an artificial beach. So many times after the winter season, right before the tourist season, like the beach season, you'll have a beach nourishment program where they basically rebuild the beach. And then when you go to the beach, you'll see it nice and sandy and wide, lots of sand. But most of that was artificially brought onto the beach from offshore. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can watch the video if you want. I have the link there. So this is just a before and after aerial photo taken this is from a beach in North Carolina. So before nourishment program, you had a 170 foot wide beach. And then after they did the nourishment program, it was now 315 feet. So see, there's a lot more space for people to come to the beach and sit on the sand, right? It makes it wider. If you were to leave it without doing the beach, run it, the beach nourishment, you would not have as much space to sit, okay? So that is the conclusion of the Coast's lecture.